Welcome, everybody, to this week's edition of the 6-5 Podcast. I'm going to play the host today along with my esteemed colleague, friend, and recently back from Cabo, Patrick Moorhead. And the only reason I point that out is if you're watching this live right now, you probably noticed that he's got a tan and I look pasty. But that's because I live in Chicago and the sun only shines three months a year, but the taxes are always high. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, yeah, welcome everyone. I, we missed last week, and we missed you last week, and we missed each other last week. We were uh, we were kind of sad we didn't have a chance to get one in, Pat. But I think you needed and deserved a much uh, you know a, a much anticipated time away, and it looked beautiful. Yes, he sent me pictures. I don't know if he published them publicly, but he was tormenting me all week long. Yeah, I was flexing a little bit. You know, I I whenever I go on an international trip. Uh, I sometimes don't like to broadcast, you know, where I'm going to be going, you know, kind of makes your, uh, your home a target. But uh, yeah, this is not an issue with my camera folks. I actually have a tan. So, yeah. which is very unlike me. Uh, I'm of Scottish descent and uh, you know, us Scots uh, have a very white skin. So, um, but it's there, it might be there for about three days and then it all flake off. But well, I'll anyways, see when I get down there when I get down to Austin this weekend. And, I uh, totally yeah. forgot about that. You're flying in. I cannot wait to get down. By the way, Austin is bo booming and rocking right now. Um, I walked home yesterday from work and um, almost every restaurant was packed on second street. So, well, it's always a good leading indicator. I hope everybody out there is being safe and that uh, you've had the chance to get your vaccine. Be comfortable. Go do that thing. I'm hoping by this fall. Oh, Pat, I got invited to a live event in November and I'm going to attend it. Um, so, you know what? It feels like that day may never have come, but it's right. coming. Yeah, I actually went to my first event yesterday. I attended uh, Dell's Match Play, uh, which, by the way, a bunch of proceeds go to Dell Children's Hospital. But uh, spent a day out there, and uh, it was nice. Literally, my first company re uh, or business related uh, event. It was awesome. Now I do feel like I have superpowers because uh, I've had COVID uh, already, and at least the, the research that that I, I read last week said, hey, if you're under 65 and you've had it, you only have a 0.54 percent chance of getting it again, and therefore giving it to somebody again. So, yeah, it's nice having superpowers for once. Yeah, well, you should probably, uh, you know, just be a little careful. But actually, all serious, I think by the next month, we're going to be um, all getting the chance to get those vaccines. And look, I can't wait to get back out. By the way, I also can't wait till we have less events, um, but that we have some. Yeah. Uh, anyway, great show I think we're going to have this week. Uh, some really interesting topics, a couple big, big topics, a couple interim incremental announcements of some new solutions. We're going to be talking uh, Intel quite a bit because that was a big part of the news cycle this week. We're going to talk about Oracle, Lattice Semiconductor, AWS, AMD, um, and an interesting advertising campaign. We're actually going to kind of start and finish with an Intel uh, focus today. Uh, but we're going to hit all kinds of things. We're calling this episode Chips and Sass Kicking. Eh, I'm not going to say <laughs> it on the air. Um, but before we get started on the show, you got to know we have to disclaim this show is for information and entertainment purposes only. And while we will be talking about publicly traded companies throughout the show, please do not take anything we say as investment advice. Or as Pat says, do the opposite. I'm sometimes concerned that that's advice. So I just say, don't listen to anything we're saying about these publicly traded companies accept all the really good analysis. Focus on that. Heavy using your head, Daniel. Analysis. You're using your head. I appreciate you, that. Using my head. And there's a lot of it, by the way, if you're watching yeah. this live. If you're listening, you can't see that, but hopefully you've figured that out by now. All right. Let's get down to it, Pat. Um, let's talk Intel. So as I said, you know, let me just set the stage. Um, it was a really big news cycle this week. You, by the way, came back um, from your seven or eight days away. And you basically um, jumped on, I think it was like one hour and 30 minutes into your first workday back. I saw your smiling face on Squawk Alley talking with uh, John Fort and the team over there uh, about some things going on with, with chips, with shortages, with semiconductors. And by the way, this was like a premonition of what came the next day when uh, Pat Gelsinger announced what Intel is calling their IDM 2.0 strategy, 2.0, 2.0. Right. And this was really, the, it was all about unleashing what 
Pat is going to do at the helm. Remember, he's only five weeks in. And um, activist investor Dan Loeb, who had written some pretty scathing remarks at a uh, time just before Pat came back about the company, its strategy, its uh, especially its manufacturing, because all its woes in the past few years have really been about meeting its timelines. And he came back and said, I've never, essentially, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but I've never seen um, a CEO make such a big impact in five weeks. So the guy was ready to, I think he put a billion into the company, was ready to start influencing, and he seems really pleased. And so, and by the way, Pat, I'm going to steal a little extra of this one because you've got like the next four topics are going to be a lot of you, but um, we'll weigh in a lot on this one. Um, but he un, uh, unleashed a strategy that had to do with manufacturing uh, and a whole number of new plants and two at the time, two immediately, a $20 billion investment going into Arizona to build two new fabs for leading edge. That's the first part. And by the way, quietly under that tone, he talked about building more fabs in the U.S. and Europe, which announcements are set to come later. Uh, we'll dig into that more. Pat, a fabless, uh, sorry, not a fabless, a foundry approach. Intel is going to get big into the foundry business, which was really interesting. And they're going to start partnering with fabs, uh, TSM, UMC, Samsung. They've, they've talked about these different partnerships. Uh, I'll let you talk about that in a minute. And then the fourth uh, piece of it was there was a new partnership with IBM on the research side uh, for them to do a lot of leading edge research. So I talked to death about this. I went on CNBC. You went on CNBC. We talked. Uh, I wrote a Market Watch op-ed. You wrote a great Forbes article. We'll link all this crud in the in the show notes, Pat. Um, I talked a lot about it, but I didn't get too deep into it. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about what each of those big four uh, announcements means? Yeah, so uh, you can read the news before. So uh, I, I want to give more <laughs> of the takeaways here. But, uh, you know, first off, uh, Gelsinger is a straight shooter. Uh, I competed with uh, Pat uh, when I was at AMD. Uh, I won a few rounds. He, run a, he, he won a, uh, some other rounds. Um, uh, I met with him when he was at VMware uh, as CEO. Uh, and I got to got a one on one with Pat on Monday and, you know, got the skinny. And I think first off, uh, he's a straight shooter. You know, I mean, he used words with me uh, about their prior performance on 10 nanometer as in abysmal, uh, uh, embarrassing. And, you know, that means a lot to me, Daniel, um, the, the openness uh, for somebody to do that. And, yeah, I get that he wasn't around uh, when this was engineered. Uh, but it doesn't matter to me. It's 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 part of what I needed to hear to give me b more believability that they could power uh, into uh, seven nanometer uh, and this twenty billion dollar investment. Uh, I I also um, uh, last tech day I, I told you I keep feeling a little better about seven nanometer and they gave more details on it and I do feel even better uh, because they're going to be using EUV which just um, increases yield. Uh, because it's less passes and you get out more chips because it's less passes. So uh, more more efficient. I will add, and, and this is what some people are misunderstanding, uh, they just kind of read my headlines or my tweets, is uh, I have more confidence in 2023 when Intel 7 nanometer comes online because they're going to be leveraging TSMC 3 nanometer uh, for what their press release said was... Um, uh, client computing products and data center products. And, and so you can imagine having a three nanometer TSMC CPU tile, which will be competing against a three nanometer AMD uh, chiplet. Uh, so it, it should be interesting. So they're hedging their bets uh, on, on TSMC. The other thing everybody needs to be aware of is, is that Intel was one of TSMC's biggest customers. Uh, and they, they've always done a, a lot of outsourcing. What's new here is for uh, doing some outsourcing of things that Intel is known for, uh, like CPUs. Uh, the other thing is this $20 billion dollar, dollar, uh, investment, and uh, this is for either IFS foundry uh, or for uh, internal consumption. I think it's only the start. I, I do think they will uh, get more money from the EU and from the US, I think combined, uh, the two continents are offering $80 billion for uh, semiconductors. And I think that uh, if uh, departments, let's call it uh, Department of Defense, 
uh, potentially even anything under critical infrastructure uh, like carrier may require uh, more of these chips to be built uh, on U.S. soil by a U.S. company. Um, and, and that kind of, um, you know, narrows it down to uh, Intel and, and global foundries. And um, global foundries is really focused on um, things like IoT and 5G as opposed to kind of the bleeding edge. At, at IFS, listen, Intel has tried the foundry game uh, before. Uh, they've had very small degrees of success. Uh, I actually think they're serious this time, and it sounds credible to me. Uh, first off, you have to have uh, standardized everything to do uh, a foundry play uh, because you're importing and exporting from things like TSMC and Global Foundries and Samsung. You have to reuse content, and you have to have an IP library. And I think uh, the only thing that made my jaw drop uh, about the IP library and what they were offering is first off, it sounds like they're offering x86 CPU cores. Okay, so think about that. Anybody uh, uh, who, you know, you could hypothetically AMD could be uh, doing that uh, out of there and potentially even tease up uh, another uh, x86 company. The other thing was risk five, okay? Um, and it has a little bit of support. Uh, I was, ex uh, and that's why it was surprising. And then the, there was uh, uh, ARM support. So um, uh, big news. I mean, Daniel, um, you know, this is causing shock waves. I mean, I'm getting, you know, contacted by, you know, data center providers, uh, PC providers, uh, Intel competitors. Uh, I'm actually talking to two of them today. <laughs> I think giving giving me their case on uh, either why this is a bad idea or a good idea, uh, I think Qualcomm's in, right? Who do I expect to be in there? I expect Qualcomm to be a customer. Is that Does that sound crazy? Yeah, right now it does. But guess what? Qualcomm used to actually fab their modems at Intel, okay? So it wouldn't be the first time. It's not going to be revolutionary. Uh, final, finally, I want to talk about the IBM. The last time IBM worked with Intel on chip IP was in the 80s and DRAM, okay? That just gives you an idea of, of how long it's been. And IBM, unbeknownst to most, because most people don't pay attention, is the leader in research uh, for transistor uh, and process technology. Why do I think that? Guess what? Guess where Samsung gets theirs from? They get theirs from IBM, uh, the second largest chip manufacturer uh, out there and leading edge on memory. So, um, gosh, Intel, the partner, look at that IP. That's all over the place, supporting everybody, uh, standard tools, supporting everybody, uh, working with IBM on, on not only process, but packaging technology, and then working with Samsung TSMC and global foundries more than they were, uh, before a lot of execution. This is, I'm not babe ruthing this. There's a ton of execution, uh, there is zero major changes that Intel can make to their architecture uh, and manufacturing capability, their own in-house manufacturing capabilities until 2023. So between now and 2023, it's going to be about marketing. It's going to be about turbocharging their fab. Like one good example today, you know, uh, recently is taking chips to, you know, five gigahertz uh, and, uh, and, and, and beyond, like using their current fab uh, uh, to go out there. So yeah, it could be, you know, I still think that AMD will gain server market share in uh, 2022. Uh, I'm less positive on client market share uh, uh, in 2022. Intel clawed back some. They, they brought a lot of low-end business for uh, Chromebooks. Why? Because they could. Uh, but, but we'll see, man. Chips are exciting. Chips are fun. Chips are sexy. Yeah, they, they really are. It's been a huge week for that particular announcement. It definitely dominated a lot of headlines. That's why it's getting the, the top of our show, and it's going to get a little more time than some of our other topics. Um, last thought or two before we move on, Pat, because you covered a ton of ground. I thought I covered a lot. You covered more. Um, long, long and short here, um, you know, my note out to the market was essentially anyone that's bearish on Intel's announcements this week are bearish because they doubt execution. You cannot look at what they announced in terms of adding 100 billion in foundry tam um, the diversification of the business the the, uh, the shared uh progress partnerships expansion that gelsinger announced and think this is bad 
The only thing you can think is bad is there's no way they're going to get it done. And you know what? Every one of us, Pat, you, me, we're all sitting there raising our hands saying, Pat uh, Gelsinger, we like what you're saying. Now you got to do it. And, yeah. and you know, he, he said something in his one of his presentations that maybe is the earmark of what we all need to watch. He talked about at VMware his say-do ratio. You know, it was what gets said versus what gets done. And he wants to have a very high ratio in terms of everything he's saying getting done. And if he does, I think the future looks bright for Intel. All right, let's move on to uh, Oracle, Pat. There's a bunch of updates. Um, <laughs> Oracle has been really outstanding from an analyst standpoint of keeping us in the loop, uh, being consistently in our faces, telling us what's going on, updating um, on the infrastructure side, updating on the, the application side. And in the past week, we've gotten some of both of them uh, on the autonomous data warehouse, which I'm gonna let you talk about, a bunch of updates on their uh, application for supply chain and a pretty cool partnership announced. Why don't you kick off the data warehousing with a little update. You wrote a great piece on Forbes there. We'll, we'll, we'll drop that in the show notes. Yeah, so uh, first off, um Oracle is a big leader in database, in case you didn't know that. And what they're shifting to is as a service, uh, like uh, everybody. And uh, Oracle Autonomous Data Warehouse uh, is exactly that. It, it's, a, it's a data warehouse, it's cloud-based, and it requires a lot less uh, TLC than, let's say, an on-prem Oracle database, or even something uh, like um, uh, a SQL. Uh, server uh, database. So um, what they did though, is they took this to a next level here. And what they did is they, uh, where in autonomous data warehouse, they, they removed a lot of uh, IT requirements um, for, for, sorry, for infrastructure uh, requirements uh, for that. What they did here is uh, remo removing uh, the need to have a bunch of um, uh, essentially database administrators, data wranglers, uh, data modelers in there. So what they did is they gave direct access, they built a layer of tools and capabilities uh, on top that allowed uh, um, business professionals uh, to go in, citizen uh, uh, analysts, uh, line of business developers to go uh, directly in and use it uh, with a SaaS uh, interface. I mean, I almost didn't believe my eyes and I did, uh, you know, I, I did, I'm like, okay, guys, is this real? Or, um, you know, is this demo uh, where they took me through even a machine learning uh, models that they had that, that were uh, all already uh, in there. So uh, essentially uh, new uh, data load capabilities, uh, new data transform capabilities, uh, new uh, automatic access to uh, even templated business models. So it automatically creates business models. I saw it in my own eyes, you know, it was real data, uh, but it is, is amazing. And, and Daniel, big picture here compared to today, compared to something like a Redshift uh, or a Snowflake, uh, they can't offer that uh, right now. So um, here we are, Oracle raising the game uh, uh, once again. And the other thing I'll add on is that um, this is one database that auto magically um, is optimized for eight or nine different types of data. And that's a little bit different in the way that AWS has it, where they have, uh, I think, 16 different databases that um, you, the enterprise, actually has to wrangle uh, uh, that data. So some big, uh, some big black and whites. I mean, I love the competitive nature of the database market. Uh, and, you know, it's funny, I'll, I'll say it here. Um, while, while it may not be as sexy as uh, microprocessors, uh, it is SaaS. So and this this episode is chips and SaaS. And I believe this is this is a SaaS approach to databases that goes directly uh, at the end user of that data. Now, it's not the tableau of it, okay, but you can get visualization here. Uh, they were, you know, quick to point out that uh, you can get visualization of the data that to me kind of looked like Tableau-ish. Um, they're like, no, no, we interact with Tableau. So uh, there, there wasn't a, you know, classic Oracle kind of, you know, 
you know when they're coming after you because they're going to tell you they're coming after you. Uh, they're not. They want to be friends with uh, with Tableau. Uh, but anyways, uh, pretty impressive, Daniel. Yeah, there's a lot there. And of course, they're going to cooperate and co-op petition, everything. That's just what's going on. If you look back at that whole Intel segment, all about competition right now, you know, Oracle, you know, they have solid relationships in some ways with like a Microsoft through, you know, shared zones and stuff that, that they're using. But at the same time, they're both comp competing for workloads. And of course, part of it is by delivering a solution that works for people. The autonomous capabilities, the, uh, you know, that you mentioned and the ability to actually handle uh, these different types of databases in a single environment is is attractive. And you know what? That's the kind of innovation you should expect from a company that's been in the database space this long. Let, let, let's tap on a couple other things, though. The company had a number of other announcements. Um, one of the big ones was part of as their CX portfolio, which is another big part of the business on the application side. Um, the year, uh, EVP, Steve Miranda, did a number of announcements along with his team and, and some big ones in the supply chain space. And, you know, supply chain management, by the way, is a pretty hot topic, Pat. We've talked quite a bit about it through what's oh, yeah. going on with the chip shortage. But, I mean, in every industry right now, and that including that ship stuck in the Suez Canal, I mean, look, supply chains matter. And when they get broken, the world realizes just how much they, ma they matter. Now, Oracle is not going to solve getting that ship uh, turned. Unfortunately, we could benefit from that. But what it is trying to do is build tools that are more comprehensive. And the announcements they came up with really focused on three things. They focused on orchestration, delivery, and innovation. Um, you know, it's, it's iterative, Pat. The things that they're doing with their SCM tool is all about adding iterative capabilities to embrace things like IoT, uh, AI, and ML process lifecycle management. So they came up with things like new production scheduling tools, new order management capabilities. So their whole kind of order to cash process um, has been updated to be a smoother in orchestration. And they put a bit of focus on IoT asset monitoring and IoT production monitoring. So you think about all this industry 4.0 stuff you hear about, well, all those uh, devices at the edge that are part of that supply chain, part of that manufacturing, uh, we keep hearing about these manufacturing, these industrial companies. Well, that stuff has to end up in software somewhere to be able to be looked at, utilized, and, and, and enriched. So Oracle is doing that. Uh, the other thing that it really focused on was, you know, the whole logistics and the delivery part. They had a new transportation management suite. They're adding um, a lot of machine learning. Uh, so, you know, in their transportation management, they put machine learning capabilities, um, for better prediction and transportation, reducing costs. I mean, look, getting goods from point A to point B is expensive. I'm, I'm the son of a trucker. Uh, my dad owned a trucking company. Uh, very important part of our supply chain. And it may seem like an old school business, but you know what? All those goods, all that stuff you order from Amazon needs to get from one place to another. And it's not being delivered by drones just yet. And by the <laughs> way, when it is all drones, um, you're going to use some AI, ML, IoT, and other tracking to make that work too. So this stuff all makes sense. It'll evolve as technology evolves. Um, you know, uh, the last thing was a focus on you know product lifestyle cycle management. So uh, Oracle's been really focused on keeping updates coming, um, not getting kind of in that rut of being a licensed software that you get updates once a year, but really doing it on a continuous basis um, and. On the product lifecycle management uh, standpoint, they're adding a number of new features just to improve analytics, improve the reporting, uh, revisions, cataloging, um, and security, by the way, has been something that's been focused on patent. You know, we probably don't talk about security enough here, but everything that we're talking about, chip level, infrastructure level, application level, companies need to be talking more about security. That's something that I expect from leading companies. And so it's always good to hear about. Um, just want to touch on one other really kind of small announcement around Oracle. They did have a kind of a fun announcement that actually uh, takes everything we've talked about into uh, into effect in some way. And that was in a partnership with Red Bull um, Honda Racing. So Red Bull Honda um, Racing, which, you know, F1, Pat down in Austin, something that uh, I'm mm -hmm. attending, um, you know, this is an end. You think about like jet planes. Well, well, F1 vehicles have a ton of data they put off. And essentially, this racing team decided to partner with Oracle, uh, its cloud infrastructure, its data systems to be able to uh, manage, enrich and perfect the, the racing team to improve everything from lap times to, you know, the uh, the vehicle designs and builds to be as competitive as possible within spec. 
pretty cool partnership. And by the way, Red Bull is one of the coolest content companies on the planet. I watched a video the other day of a guy on a parachute landing through a ski town, skiing on the roofs of buildings, Pat. It was like, pfft, my mind was blown. This guy lands on the ground. He's skiing backwards. He pulls his parachute in, okay? Pulls a Red Bull out of his jacket, cracks it open, chugs the Red Bull, tosses it into it, and they're doing all this cool production. And then he throws his parachute back up and takes off into the sky again. I mean, this stuff is fun. Anyways, side note on the Red Bull thing. But um, very, very cool announcement. They're also incorporating all of the CX stack from the F1 standpoint to connect closer to their fans, which is the people that are watching those videos that I mentioned. So they're really putting the whole Oracle stack into play, Pat. A lot you of people. Cool, uh, you think we'll get an invite to uh, to F1 here uh, in Austin? What do you think? Why do you think I'm talking about it, man? Oracle, are you listening? I want to go, <laughs> I want to go see the cars race. I want to hear those combustion engines exploding. When do you think it'll be F1 electric? That I don't. Uh, you know, there is actually um, uh, an F1 electric uh, series out there that uh, all the big uh, players are in. It just doesn't get as much play. Nvidia is uh, is big time uh, behind that. Um, companies like on semiconductor, even BMW as a car. So, but by the way, uh, I think every one of the, uh, cars is the same. So it's not one of these big engineering, um, face-offs uh, either, but Daniel, I just, uh, just a final word on, on this. I just want to point out the huge difference. You know, when you have an Oracle fusion app, uh, literally they're updated. There's a quarterly update, not all of them update, um, uh, but most of them do. And I compare that to uh, an SAP ERP or SCM, and you're looking at, at, at customers might update once every three to five years. Um, and, you know, it, 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 I'm just fascinated with how quickly the company has moved. Now, how did they do it? They did it through acquisition. Uh, but that acquisition of NetSuite gave them some time to uh, rebuild uh, their on-prem ERP and SCM from the uh, from the ground up to have a cloud. I'm wondering what happens when you know uh, you know Oracle has booked you know two, they actually have two cloud uh, 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 opportunities of the same uh, application, and I wonder at some point you know do, do they merge? But we're talking about uh, NetSuite and Fusion, which have exactly. both growing and kind of in mirror. Um, and both a little different. I've actually set up and run NetSuite on a company I ran years ago uh, before Oracle acquired them. But yeah, it's a it's a growing business. And by the way, those are two of the fastest growing areas, you know, uh, mid double digit growth in both areas, um, different products. But yeah, I mean, at some point, doesn't it all have to sort of just become one big suite? Uh, I don't know. That's going to yeah, put it. Yeah. And maybe, maybe the UI is different. I don't know for, for, you know, smaller business. I got to tell you, you know, my back office, I picked Google uh, 10 years ago and not Microsoft because Google was just so much more interesting. Now that was more IaaS as opposed to business management. But uh, to me, simplification is key for me for my small business. And, you know, maybe, maybe that's uh, why NetSuite, um, uh, hangs in there, but hey, sorry to uh, sorry to digress here. Oh, I know we've got uh, a bunch tough. of other things. Now here's the deal: we've made it through two topics, and we're 28 minutes in. Five <laughs> is, uh, is, is derailed, but we're going to try to make the next three topics a bit of a lightning round because we've got three kind of quick update type things. Um, we're not going to shortchange them, but we're talking uh, chips, chips, and chips. Um, and we've got our first updates coming uh, from Lattice Semiconductor, which is a company we probably don't talk enough about. But Pat, you have been an FPGA bull. And this is a company that's been absolutely capitalizing. And we've had Jim Anderson on our show, on this show, right. CEO. Great, uh, great guy doing really interesting things. And there's a few updates there. Um, there are. Yeah, so just really quick background. There's only a few different types of chips you can have. You can have CPU, GPU, FPGAs, DSP, ASIC, okay? And I'm sure I'll get hate mail uh, from people uh, telling me that's that's there's more or less, but that's it. An FPGA is completely programmable. It can be programmable um, to uh, anything that uh, that you want. In fact, when I was at AMD, we used to use FPGAs uh, first, at, uh, creating CPUs. But FPGAs have evolved 
uh, into very application specific types of things. And oh, by the way, it saves you about a year in development uh, versus an ASIC, uh, and um, but are a little bit harder to program than a CPU. So what, what happens is companies like um, uh, Lattice uh, will bring out full solution sets. Uh, with their FPGAs to make it easier for uh, developers to uh, uh, to make that uh, uh, happen. Uh, so, and that's exactly what um, uh, Lattice's last announcement was. It was on M Vision and Century. So, Century is uh, an absolute uh, uh, layer of security that uh, developers might put on a server motherboard. That uh, its first boot. Uh, requires, um, uh, enables you to even um, track that motherboard uh, through the supply chain uh, as it moves from uh, a point to point. You know, the first question when somebody's talking about hardware security for me is I ask, what's the first chip to boot up? And and what's so cool about what uh, Lattice does is their FPGA, which is, by the way, on every Intel and AMD motherboard uh, uh, recently is the first thing, and it scans to see if spy chips were put on. It scans um, root of trust. I mean, it, it it's pretty incredible. Uh, M Vision uh, was updated, and this is for what you might think: machine learning vision uh, on a robot, uh, on a drone, uh, and and what they did is they um, enhanced it um, with uh, uh, an IS uh, sorry a an ISP solution. Uh, which just gave it uh, more horsepower to do uh, what it needed to do. Uh, and that's my that's my story, and I'm sticking to it, and I'm keeping it brief. Yeah, well, we have to because we took if we, our 6.5 became the 6.76 today. Um, if we actually <laughs> went in depth. But listen, we love you, our audience. And when something's big like this IDM2 strategy, we just got to give it the time. Um, we hope you appreciate all that analysis. A um, couple more chip updates, Pat. And uh, next one was EC2 X2GD, another homegrown variant of, uh, of the Graviton family has gone GA. This should be a quick one too, because this is really something we talked about a while back, but now it is available and it continues, by the way, all that arm talk. This is, uh, this is where this, uh, the rubber meets the road. Yeah, by the way, what I, what I really appreciated was that uh, this was launched uh, very similarly around uh, when AMD Epic uh, third generation uh, was launched. And uh, we know, yeah, exactly. And we know that uh, <laughs> Ice Lake from Intel is coming up, but essentially uh, uh, Amazon has a, Amazon has built a um, their own homegrown general purpose processor. They do a lot of their own process. This is general purpose, competes with uh, Epic uh, and, and Xeon. They're on their second generation. But it's not just about the processor, right? It has to be married up with uh, different uh, memory levels uh, and networking. And and what uh, X2G, sorry, X2GD are memory optimized uh, instances. And the value proposition is delivering up to 55% better price performance compared to current generation X86, X1 instances. So hard comparison to, to uh, what they're doing uh, versus uh, Intel. And uh, what does memory intensive mean? Hey, it's databases. It's uh, MySQL, Postgres. It's in-memory databases, Redis, Memcached. Uh, it's EDA workloads, real-time analytics, caching servers. Uh, it is no longer tiny, teeny, tiny uh, little streaming applications that uh, were supported on uh, first generation uh, uh, Graviton. So this is Graviton growing up uh, and going GA at the same time that Epic uh, uh, came out, which uh, is pretty awesome. Like I said, competition is good for everybody, lowers costs, increases innovation. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, why don't I let you just keep the momentum going, man? Uh, you're you're on a roll. Oh uh, yeah, baby. Let's go into uh, third. Yeah, oh, let's. Go. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say you already kind of teed it up. So uh, yeah, let's go into. Going, uh, I'm gonna. I'm sitting back. I'm just gonna watch this. Yeah. So a uh, uh, third generation Epic uh, general purpose processor competes directly uh, with uh, Xeon and and Graviton. Um, believe it or not, AMD used to be in the CPU market. Uh, when I was actually at uh, AMD, uh, AMD had 26% of the entire server market. Uh, they're at 10% now with Epic, but they had left the market for six or seven uh, uh, years. Market's different, right? AMD started this year with cloud 
and then they moved to uh, this was really to me the enterprise uh, the the enterprise data center launch, which brought all the software with it and all of the partners that 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 you would expect. The big change here is uh, moving to a new core architecture um, uh, with uh, Zen three. And, and literally that's how they were able to drive um, a 20% uh, performance uh, improvement. Now, obviously where they, they beefed up uh, some other elements versus uh, Intel's current in market, you know, you're looking at 50% uh, adders uh, and also where AMD might have a core count uh, increase. Uh, and it's all about timing here because uh, uh, AMD compared against what's in market, not what Intel is going to be announcing uh, in the next couple of weeks with uh, with 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 Ice Lake. But super impressed uh, with the what they were able uh, uh, to do here. The other change that they made was um, uh, uh, memory architecture differences, which allowed uh, each core to address uh, more more memory. Uh, out there, and and what that does is that uh, decreases latency, and and makes it a much better, let's say, a database uh, a database processor. Heck, uh, Lenovo came out and said, uh, with Epic, uh, we have um, increased. Uh, sorry, we have scored a hundred benchmarking world records. Okay, which I just thought was just crazy and ludicrous. Yes, there are more than a hundred server uh, benchmarks uh, out there. And whether it's, you know, floating point, database, there's even one for VMware. Uh, there's one for straight, I, you know, spec uh, for, you know, more uh, contiguous with IPC. There's floating point, Java virtual machine, which is what uh, most uh, enterprise applications uh, are, are based off of. So, you know, Daniel, we're gonna have to see the, uh, we're gonna have to see the details here. Yeah. Uh, OEMs are ramping up, cloud vendors are ramping up uh, uh, with Epic. Um, you know, I believe that, I don't believe TSMC can give AMD as much as they need uh, out there. And you've got new Intel stuff going in there, an Intel who still has 90% market share, even with multiple generations of world record performance from Epic. Which, uh, when we get into the Intel conversation, we'll talk about maybe maybe why that is. Hey, hey listen, um, you can see the disappointment on my face. <laughs> I'm disappointed because you're talking about uh, these benchmark records. And by the way, cool stuff, if that's your thing, if you're one of these geek bench people that want to look at this. I'm sure there's a few CIOs that care about this. I'm pretty sure that entire, that entire business of these benchmarks and records, though, is for everyone in the industry to pat each other's back about their own situations and lives. It's like the, every kid gets a ribbon thing now. It's like, we're gonna come up with 900 benchmarks. By the way, some analyst firms do this too. It's, it's actually kind of embarrassing sometimes. You know, they have an award for everything. It's like, are you really giving an award or are you just trying to give somebody some social recognition? Anyways, I digress. I can't help myself, Pat. Look, long and short on the whole AMD Epic third gen thing, enterprise is gonna be a big lift for them to compete. Even with the improved performances, um, they are, uh, AMD is about to go up against Ice Lake, uh, next generation, which is going to be uh, likely very competitive as opposed to what they're comparing now. The other thing is, you know, and I've done a lot of, of, of analysis on this in the past, Pat, is getting the workloads in enterprise moved from these companies yeah. have big Intel commits is not an easy thing. It has not been an easy thing. And Intel has been heavily invested in making sure and that, by the way, has a lot to do why that 90 plus percent market share still exists. However, Lisa is doing a great job. Uh, every generation continues to press uh, and push and put more pressure on Intel. And I expect the battle will rage on. And by the way, that makes it fun because when we're talking about chips and SaaS kicking, eh, <laughs> that's, uh, that, that, you know, that is uh, the topic we want to talk about. So it's healthy, healthy debate. Um, bring it so last topic pat and this kind of um, uh this is something we missed last week it would have been our probably our our main dive uh, yeah. in a normal week but you know i i get an email so the week before like intel is just doing the, their thing now this has got to be pat because for a long time like i said there just wasn't this much energy but one thing Intel hasn't done over the last couple of years is really push back on its critics the way maybe it would have 
in its earlier life. Um, and I don't know what that was exactly, but Intel nabbed the Mac to come be its spokesperson. And by the way, Apple has nabbed part of that advertising campaign and flipped it around. They're doing their thing. But in a what I call a sprint-like moment from Verizon, when they got the can you hear me guy to go from Verizon to Sprint, um, Intel grabbed Justin Long, who is not only known as the Mac, but also he's been in lots of different movies, and um, to come in kind of do a whole punchy, fun, not really contentious, but competitive, but definitely in a, in a form that hasn't been Intel for a long time, kind of snapping back at the M1. And Pat, you, by the way, are the M1 uh, guy uh, and, and many other things. But if you've read Pat's Forbes column, he's written some very in-depth pieces about M1 versus uh, x86 and what's going on in that ecosystem. I think you have like one of the most read pieces on the planet on that topic, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's a humble brag, but it doesn't count if I do it for you. Um, but in all seriousness, you know, I watched these ads, Pat, and I giggled and I giggled. Yeah. Like I watched, I still like the one where, and I showed these in a different cast I did last week, but where Justin Long has the kid and he's gaming at his PC and he's gaming and he's gaming and he looks over and there's a Mac station. And he goes, why is no one gaming over on the Mac? And then the gamer looks at him and goes, nobody games on a Mac. And then he goes, oh, I knew that. You know, and he did it like, and it just kind of made me smile. But, um, you know, if he's right or wrong, I just thought it was really clever, Pat. I mean, I, my kind of thought was it was clever. It was a clever play. It wasn't, you know, the most cutting edge thing ever, but just an interesting way to sort of say we're back, we're confident, and we're going to, we're not going to just take, uh, you know, this migration laying down. Yeah, so um, there are different audiences of people who have differing uh, views of caring on this. And you have the, the people who will only buy a Mac and would never even get near a Windows machine. And then there are people who have Windows machines that would never even even think of, of, of having a Mac. And then you have the people who are potentially switchers in the middle. Uh, this campaign was targeted at the potential switchers uh, and also uh, to give OEMs a little bit more confidence uh, out there, uh, which I think is good. You know, I, I love that, um, you know, the, the Apple crowd kind of came out and I think their biggest um, complaint out there was that um, Apple did some compositing on uh, the videos to make the Macs look better than, than they actually are. So, you know, I think that's if that's the extent of the complaints, uh, I think that's that's pretty weak uh, kind of fishing for something, looking for something that's wrong. And listen, uh, it wasn't perfect, but I would say that um, most of it was 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 very true. I ha I have personally found uh, software configurations on the M1 that last just as long as Intel PCs uh, out there uh, on the, particularly the Evo ones. Uh, so. Uh, uh, check. Uh, you can get Windows with touchscreens. Uh, yes, uh, you can get um, Windows devices that have much more variations. You can get ones that are leather. You can get ones that are pleather. You can get plastic. You can. I mean, you know, that's 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 all true. Uh, everything just works. Yes, every peripheral just works. Caveat had. Uh, Windows 10. <laughs> uh, there are devices that I found, uh, like printers, uh, SSD uh, cards with fingerprint readers on them that did not work with the, the M1 Mac. All true. Games, the top AAA games, uh, most of them uh, do not work on, on a Mac. So uh, most all true. Now, uh, things that, that were kind of in the middle. And, you know, if you wanted to scrutinize it, uh, the dongle thing, yes, uh, the Dell XPS 13, I need dongles for because it it's all USB-C uh, Thunderbolt. Uh, yeah, Max can play some AAA titles uh, and you can actually rig your display to have more than one external display uh, by, by uh, installing the display link software. Is it the same color depth? frequency? No. Is it supported by Apple? No, but you can rig it uh, up. So I, I just have to say that in the, in the spirit, spirit of open and honesty uh, and what we call accuracy that I know that our 
um, our audience uh, needs from us. But overall, I think they're doing, they're accomplishing what they need to accomplish. Uh, I think it gives other people uh, in Intel's ecosystem partners, ISVs. And when I combine this uh, with what I thought was a freaking hilarious uh, commercial that uh, uh, Microsoft run, uh, it was good. Uh, final point, successful campaigns like this need to combine humor, snark, uh, and truth. And for the most part on this campaign, I'm seeing, I'm seeing all three. Could they screw it up? Uh, yes, but from what I've seen so far, uh, I think it's I think it's very uh, impactful to those audiences uh, that it matters to. Yeah, absolutely. Look, and and nobody doubts for a moment the cleverness of Apple, nor the quality. You know, if I do a kind of a car analogy, I look at uh, you know Apple's kind of like Tesla. You know, you got like each flavor, and there's only a couple of options, and people still love it, and they buy it, and they use it, and they tout it, and they they are passionately connected to the brand. Um, you know, and if you, if you do like that car analogy, you could look at, uh, you know, the PCs are like more like a BMW. You got a lot of variants of the vehicles. You got lots of variants within the vehicles. You can have bigger, smaller. If you want an SUV, there's eight flavors of it. And then on top of the eight flavors, there's eight more trims of it. And, yeah. and so, and everyone's different, but in the end, the whole nabbing the Mac thing was, you know, what I really took away from it is under Pat, you know, we started and we'll kind of finish this under CEO Pat Gelsinger. This is a company that is no longer going to uh, be willing to just kind of sit idle when others are, are poking the bear. Um, they've done a lot of good things. And I even mentioned this in my most recent market watch piece. Bob Swan did a lot of good things during his time there, but some of them didn't get noticed because they were pretty humble about it. And in a world where everybody's out in front all the time, beating their chest, touting their wares, it's a good time for Intel as well to, to participate. And I like this because it wasn't obtuse. It wasn't offensive. It wasn't, you know, over the top and it even played on some history. Um, and I think it's going to work out well for the company, but we just like the IDM two strategy are going to have to wait and see. But there you go. There you have it. Chips and sass kicking. You say it. Yeah. Yeah. You, he didn't say it. Um, we got to want to get, I don't want to get canceled was, or muted. This yeah. was the six, eight today. Um, you know what? Maybe that's what we're just going to call it going forward. Probably. Not. Listen, hey, the, if the all in guys can go for an hour and 20 minutes and I get it, they're billionaires and we're not. But, uh, you know, we cover some different stuff, but if they can get away with it every week. You know, we can go 50 minutes one week. Hey, just spend a little more time on the bike, the treadmill, the elliptical, whatever you're doing when you're listening to us. But we do appreciate you. We really do love our audience and we love the growth that we've seen. 70 episodes, Pat. And by the way, keep your eyes peeled. The 65 Summit 2021 is going to be coming your way. More info on that pretty soon. We've got a lineup that you will be excited about. Remember last year we had Michael Dell, Lisa Sue, Doug Merritt from Splunk, uh, incoming CEO Cristiano Oman from Qualcomm. We're going to have another list like that, people that are going to garner your attention. So we hope you will sign up when we are ready and we let you know. But for this episode of the 6.5 Podcast, chips and sass kicking as we got to say goodbye. Um, hit that subscribe button. Check out the show notes. Read all the articles. We'll be back. We'll have more for you soon. But for now, we're out. See you later.